So yeah, user groups are awesome, and I'm going to go really fast. There's a blog version linked at the end. It has a bunch of links, and so be ready for it. Awesome people go to user groups. I'm Christopher Kralo. I go by Kralo on the internet, GitHub, Twitter, all that good stuff. I work for Calcomai. We are looking for interns, so if you're new to Ruby uh, and you're here to learn, stop by, say hi to me, say hi to the Calcomai team, get to know us. I run Dallas Ruby now. Uh, and now Mark is working full time, as well, I guess full pastime, if you would say. Full right, full extra time on Big Ruby. Uh, I'm an Elixir language uh, enthusiast, right? Thank you. Uh, and I'm kind of got a, a user group for Elixir going, and we'll get some more of that this year. And in case it wasn't obvious, I love bacon. So who here is awesome? And by awesome, I mean you go to user groups and you talk to your fellow Rubyists. Raise your hand. Excellent, excellent. Hopefully we'll get everybody. So why should you go to a, a, a Ruby user group? Well, make a lot of friends. Plenty of networking to be had. Plenty of learning to be done. You can also do some teaching. And as we all know, when you're teaching, you're also learning at the same time. You're becoming really good at your craft. A lot of times there's hack nights, so you work on code and coffee shops with other people. You can do speaking like this. And don't be afraid to speak. New developers are always welcome to come speak. There's listeners at all skill levels. And speeches can be short. It can be five minutes. And it turns out, if you package up four lightning talks, you can get to a conference. <laughs> there you go. That's, uh, that, that's Chrismo right there. <laughs> so we're in this together, right? So bring your friends, bring your coworkers, bring your significant other. It's a grand time. So why should you go? Ask a bunch of questions, get help, right? Keep up with cool new toys, right? The latest gems, the latest vulnerabilities. So here's some local user groups. I know there's a lot of y'all from like not Texas. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, there's my favorite, of course, Dallas Ruby Group. We meet every Tuesday, presentations on the first Tuesday, Hack Nights other Tuesdays, address stuff. We're on free node. There's Ruby Fort Worth. I'm totally jealous of their name. Uh, they meet on the fourth Tuesday for presentations. There's this obscure downtown Dallas Ruby on Rails group. And yeah, I wish they'd just come to Dallas Ruby. But uh, they're on Meetup. They meet once a month sometimes, usually on a Tuesday. Uh, there's also some Ruby groups in Austin. Uh, there's one for Ruby, one for Rails. They meet on Tuesdays. So spread the word. Uh, bit.ly slash Ruby groups should be easy to remember. And I'll put the rest of this lightning talk on that blog soon. So get everybody you know to, to a Ruby group. We're nice people. We're here to help. And we'll make you better. All right. Thanks, man. Uh, so my name is Aaron Lesang. I work for OrgSync. There's a number of us here. You might have seen us walking around. Uh, and I want to talk to you about interactions. So I want to start by actually talking about, hello, there we go, um, a controller and an action within a controller. So when you first started with Rails, you probably saw like, I don't know, a video about how to make a blog or something. Maybe you scaffolded something and it looked nice, right? It was pretty clean. You could understand what was going on. It was concise and you were pretty happy with what you had. You wanted to then notify a new user, you know, you wanted to welcome them. Your app wanted to be friendly. So you get some more people on. And now you've got communities, and you've got groups, and communities have default groups, and you need to put the person into a default group when they join, and then you need to notify the admin so that they know about it. And what was kind of nice and clean has started to look a bit more like this. It's still not horrendous, but it's more than you'd probably like to happen there. And so you hire some more developers. Maybe a year goes by, you reopen the thing, and it's gone from this to like 500 lines, and it, you're kind of like this now, right? Things have gotten bad. So a lot of us had this, and there was a rallying cry in the community, skinny controllers and fat models. We're going to take all that business logic and shove it down into the model, because in MVC, we decided that's where it belonged. Well, we fought back. We refactored. We got there. Users can now join groups. right? They could send password reminders, you know, find other users, start dating, see other models, that kind of thing. And, uh, Suddenly, we opened that file a year later again, and we had got objects. We had 1,500 line models. Everyone's had these in their code base at some point, and they're just horrendous. And we basically had the exact same problem, and we yelled, more models. We're going we're gonna to use the M in the MVC more. The thing is, I think Rails has a tendency to point us toward nouns when we're thinking about models, and only nouns. 
So we have persisted models. We save them into the database. And it took us a while to get our heads around not doing this. Even after blog posts like the Kingdom of Nouns, we still do a lot of this kind of stuff. And we sort of just take all of our actions and we drop them on these nouns as kind of second class citizens in our code. But what we need to do is we need to upgrade these verbs. We need to make them first class citizens. They deserve a life of their own. We need a place for business logic to be held and not spread across five models where it's hard to understand and hard to refactor. And this is where interactions has come in handy, especially for us at OrgSync. We've found these really helpful. And the pattern is essentially to take your business logic and encapsulate it, push your models into it, and it gives you a place to really kind of keep everything together in a tight package. So we tried a few different methods of going about this, and we ended up writing our own gem. And it's called Active Interaction. So if we go for a user sign up, I know this is a little small, but we'll kind of go into it. Um, we can create this interaction for signing up a user where all of the logic is contained solely within this interaction. If you need to know about signing up a user, this is where you go. If you've got to have multiple controllers where this happens for some reason, they're all going to call this. So when we call it, it's just sign up user, run, and then whatever parameters we want to pass in. Run is the only option you get. It's a very single responsibility. It's going to sign up a user, that's all. When you pass that in, your parameters come in, and we provide a mechanism to essentially uh, parse your parameters into what they should be. And if they're not, for instance, a date, right? if you try to pass in like a word where you should have a date, it'll throw an error and yell at you about this. Um, you can have defaults, including nil, which makes it optional. And we've added the ability to do things like make sure that your array coming in is all strings if you want, or maybe you've got room preferences. And within there, there's keys on this hash that are Booleans or integers that'll cast those as well. It also has validations. These should look really, really familiar because they're active model validations. They're things we've all worked with and we're all familiar with. And once again, if you do stuff like custom validations, maybe you've got a password validator, you can use that in there, no problem. If we get past all of the validations, we call execute. You can kind of think of this as uh, the initialize on a new, newly constructed object. Same kind of deal. So we come in here, we go through what we need to do, and all of our things, all of our business logic is contained within the execute statement. In this case, we can actually build other interactions, like joining a default group, compose them in. If they fail, the errors get propagated up to the primary object. So the call now looks something like this. User sign up run, you get an outcome. The outcome has errors, has the valid predicate. You can shove it into forms. It works with Formtastic. It works like you would expect because it quacks like an active model. It works in all the same ways. So that code now starts to look more like this, a lot closer to what we had at the beginning, a lot closer to what we were happy with, and a lot more simple to grok when you're trying to figure out what's going on. So active interaction, we get slim controllers and slim models. It's Rails and forms ready, and it gives you a really good place to encapsulate business logic. So if that sounds good to you, you can find it on GitHub at orgsync slash active underscore interaction. Myself and Taylor are the primary developers on this. We're both at the conference. Feel free to grab us and ask questions if you have any. And thank you. Oh, fancy meeting y'all here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit real quick about the Lone Star Ruby Foundation. Right? Um, the Lone Star Ruby Foundation is a soon to be 501c3 organization that's dedicated to the I guess, overall health and well-being of the Texas software development community, right? Um, we started off doing mainly Ruby events and Ruby functions. We've helped uh, organize uh, the last two LSRCs. Um, but we want to do more, right? Uh, we're not doing an LSRC this year primarily because we want to kind of do other, some other things, right? Um, so no LSRC this year. We want to do more small events, other small events. And we're looking for better ways to help out, help out the community. Um, we, we want to be a place where user groups can come and if they need sponsorships or if they're trying to attract speakers that we can help out with that, right? If conferences find themselves 
short on cash or they need a big sponsorship to help pay con freaks for it to come out or something like that. We w Lone Star Reef Foundation wants to be that kind of organization, right? Um, so we do sponsorships, we do scholarships. We, we, want, uh, we want things like LSRC to be not only an Austin thing, right? We're dedicated to Texas as a whole, not just Austin, not just Central Texas, right? Uh, our, our idea, our view, our vision for LSRC is to be kind of like Cascadia, right? Where it kind of moves around from year to year or two years to two years because we're going to have one again in 2015, right? Uh, but we don't know what it's going to look like. We want it, we want it to be personalized, right? We want it to showcase Texas as a whole, right? So if LSRC is in Dallas, right? We want it to be in a place like this or, or something like this, right? If it's going to be in Houston, we want it to showcase Houston, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have any ideas, you know, send us an email, uh, follow us on Twitter. We, the main reason I'm up here is because we've done a really bad job up until now about talking about ourselves and, and reaching out to the community and letting them know that we're here and we have money in the bank and we want to help, right? So this is a small step in that direction. But uh, yes, please feel free to send an email. Um, we're going to start talking a little bit more about our overall vision and goals, right? Um, we're committed, like I said, we're committed to helping out developers in any way we can, right? We're committed to encouraging diversity in the Texas developer landscape, right? We want to sponsor things like Rails Girls and Rails Bridge and events like that. We want to get kids interested in software development and Maybe Ruby in particular, but maybe not, right? Whatever floats their boat. Do you want to do a Minecraft kind of school session thing? That'd be super awesome. We'd love to help with that. So, yeah, send an email, follow us on Twitter. If you have any ideas, suggestions, or I guess just need help, that's it. Thanks. All right, uh, my name is Jeremy, and I work for Calcomine. And around this time last year, uh, I got my first interview ever for a web, web dev position, and Kakamai hired me on as, a, as an intern. And about a month ago, they actually made me full time. So uh, that was a great uh, big step for me. <laughs> so um, because of that, um, I decided to come do a talk a little bit about it. So, so what is this about? <laughs> well, it's kind of like my story about how I started from the bottom and now I'm here. <laughs> No, really, what is this about? <laughs> um, well, uh, the inspiration for me doing a talk basically started with a question I was asked the other day. So uh, I was sitting in on an interview with a candidate for an intern for this year, and um, the guy asked me, well, you know, how did you make the jump from intern to full time? And uh, I know that the translation of this question was really, uh, how can I make the jump from intern to full time employee as well? And uh, my answer was kind of like that, because <laughs> uh, I never really thought about it. I, I, you know, I basically just tried my hardest and and worked, and eventually they liked me. <laughs> so, um, but after spending a few days thinking about it, uh, I was able to come up with kind of what I did, and and basically to answer that question, I made the app, or <laughs> I actually mean app. So uh, I basically came up with three things that I feel like were the real keys for me uh, making the jump from intern to full-time employee. And um, if you take the first letter of each word, you get app. So, um, so each letter stands for something. The first A is, I mean, the first letter is A, and that stands for ask questions. So um, Kralo is kind of like a mentor of mine. And, you know, I work with him a lot, and he's always, you know, really telling me, like, you have to ask questions. You have to ask questions. And you hear this a lot, but uh, sometimes it can be intimidating, but it's really uh, crucial in learning and uh, taking the next step because, uh, and, and also, one thing I've learned about asking questions is that it, it really is a, a skill, and, it's, a, and it's, a, it's an art form, really, like, and it's something that you can develop and get good at. And... Um, you have to be able to ask the right questions. And when you ask the right questions, you'll get the right answers. And when you get the right answers, you'll get the right strategy. 
And when you get the right strategy, you'll get the right results. So it's important to ask questions. And who you ask questions can look like this, Google, or you look like this, <laughs> your boss. <laughs> but caution when you ask people who uh, you work with, because um, I know this very well, that sometimes it can be a little intimidating. And you know, at first, the first time you ask a question, OK, you know, good job, you're asking questions. Second time you ask a question, oh, even better. Third time you ask a question. <laughs> And then the fourth time, <laughs> now they're just mad. So yes, this, this can be very intimidating, but it is necessary for learning. And, um, and, and the reason why it's necessary is because when you don't ask questions and you really don't know what you're doing, uh, you always risk the, uh, the possibility of that moment when you realize that all of the code that you wrote doesn't work. <laughs> And you just want to get away, but you can't. And you realize, well, I should have just asked a question about this. Um, so the P in the app that uh, helped me was something I came up with called a PDD. And I know most of you probably heard of TDD, test-driven uh, development, or BDD, behavior-driven development. So I kind of came up with purpose-driven development. And um, it's basically like a software development process that I kind of require myself to uh, answer three questions before I ever write a single line of code. And those questions are, uh, first deals with the intention of this code. So what is my intention uh, or my intentions in writing this code? Is it to, um, am I creating something new? Am I adding to something? Am I, is it to test? Is it to refactor? Just you know, make, more, make my code cleaner and more readable? So what is the intentions behind the code? Uh, second question, uh, what is the unmet need? So um, I guess if you view code as simply like a, a means of addressing a problem, well, it's important to know what that problem is. And I take that just a step further and say, OK, well, uh, if there's a problem, well, well, where does that problem come from? And I think really the root of any problem is there's an unmet need. So uh, what is the unmet need? And then the, the third and last question for PDD is, uh, what is the significance? And you know, really, it's just like, um, kind of like, you know, is anybody really going to use this? Like, is this significant? Like, am I going to get anything out of this? Like, you know, you don't want to waste your time doing something that uh, really has no significance. So, uh, I thought that was an important question to ask as well. And the last P in my app for uh, making the jump is practice. And I know we kind of know practice like this, and it's just repetition, doing it over and over and over again, but uh, I actually, I really want to encourage for anybody who's new and who's really trying to like uh, get better that you almost kind of have to practice slash be obsessed with code. And I've noticed this from the people that I admire the most who are really great programmers that, you know, if not now, at one point of time in their life, they were obsessed with this. And, and it really kind of, you know, that's all they thought about and it's, it's what they really look forward to doing. And um, it kind of made me think of this question, well, you know, there's balance versus unbalance, and I mean that as far as, like, your life. You know, um, typically we hear that, you know, oh, well, your, your life should have balance. Like, you should, you know, kind of uh, keep everything in, in proportion and not too much of anything, and uh, obsession kind of has a bad connotation to it. So I decided to do a comparison. So here's balance guy. That's me. Um, I'm kind of like scuba diving in South Africa. Well, I'm actually just in front of a fish tank. Um, <laughs> so, uh, well, so I, I take myself for example. Before I started working as a web developer, um, I was a barista. Uh, I was still, I still consider myself a web developer, rock climber, basketball player, uh, traveler. You know, I had all these things I was kind of dabbling into, and uh, you know, I considered myself, you know, an overall cool guy, but in very balanced. And then. Uh, an unbalanced guy. <laughs> this is Peyton Manning. <laughs> and uh, in this picture, he's actually, he hurt his ankle. So as he was icing it to double task, he was kind of like, well, let me uh, put my helmet on and listen to uh, messages from the coach and also like look over game film. This is an unbalanced guy. <laughs> and, you know, we've all heard the same things of how people describe unba unbalanced guy or uh, Peyton Manning. You know, he's a workaholic. 
Uh, his life is out of balance. He's obsessed. He needs some balance in his life. But is it possible that just perhaps that uh, unbalanced guy, you know, Peyton Manning, who spends countless hours of looking over game, game film and preparing for the game and, you know, every day just, you know, trying to get better, trying to get better, trying to get better. Is it possible that just maybe unbalanced guy is just as happy as a balanced guy or even gold? Maybe unbalanced guy is even happier than balanced guy. So that's, I'll let you decide that. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I'd say the, the three keys for my making the jump from intern to FTE, ask questions, have a purpose in you know, your development process, and practice. Be obsessed with it. That's it. Thank you. And there we go. Okay, so uh, my name is uh, Jeff Davis. You can find me on uh, the interwebs and GitHub and everything else at Penland 365. I work at Sabre in the labs group. Mark is my direct boss. So if you don't like what I have to say, just blame him because he gave me the time off to be here. So um, I was thinking that I wanted to give a talk. I wasn't sure what it was going to do. I wanted to stretch myself and do this. And then the inspiration for this talk came yesterday morning when I was sitting in traffic and I learned about the passing of uh, Jim Weirich. And I'm relatively new to the community and y'all have heard some very kind of touching tributes by people that have been in it longer. Um, and I was here last year, it's kind of my first, I'm joining into the Ruby community. And I went up and asked him what I thought was a very noobish question and in fact it was. And he didn't treat it that way at all. Uh, he gave a very thoughtful response, he took his time. He didn't rush me out of the group to go talk to somebody else that he'd known for 15 years. Uh, I, I was very kind of honestly touched by that. And I went home later and I kind of looked him up and I came across a talk that uh, I really, really liked and I think many of y'all have seen before. And that's called uh, Why Not? Adventures in Functional Programming. He gave that at RubyConf of 2012. I'd be willing to bet there's people that probably saw that live. And as someone that kind of came to Ruby at a later date, uh, I have kind of recently fallen back in love with functional programming. Um, I love Ruby, but my kind of first love is more right now Scala and a little bit of closure. And so this talk is very brief. It's going to be three functional programming tools or three, uh, excuse me, three functional programming words that the functional programming guys like to say a lot and like to be kind of honestly a little condescending about. That's okay. Um, but all of these things actually exist in Ruby. And that's what we're going to talk about real quick. Uh, so the first is a closure. Um, I'm sure a lot of y'all probably heard this, but go through this real quick. If we have an array of nums and we want to do a nums.select, we pass it a block. Every Ruby programmer has seen this from the beginning. But the question is, is x, x mod 2 equals 0 a closure? Technically, it is not. It's what is known as an anonymous function, but this is Ruby. We got ducks that can walk and talk all over the place, so we're going to call it a closure. If you wanted to actually make it a closure, you might have something like this. Uh, same thing where you define the nums array, and then evens, we're going to define a proc. And then here we do puts nums select, and we pass it that specific block. Uh, I don't know if that's very idiomatic uh, Ruby code. I have started doing this more and more in mine, where instead of using a, uh, instead of using a private method that has a side effect, I will simply declare something like this if I'm going to use it more than once just so I can uh, return it to myself. Uh, moving forward, next step up is uh, tail recursion, which is something that we use for, uh, in functional programming world, to do iter uh, iterations, basically. The difference between recursion and tail recursion, in recursion, you perform your recursive calls first until you hit your lower bound, then pass the calculated result back up the stack. Tail recursion is similar, but uh, it's got one, different, one important difference. You perform your calculation first, then pass the calculated result into the recursive body. Uh, the difference, as this turns out, is entirely when the compiler runs, the stack, the amount of memory that you have to allocate. Um, go forward real quick. Here's an actual code example. If we're going to sum, like, say, numbers 1 to 7, uh, return x if x is equals to 1. Otherwise, step into the function. But if we want to do it in a tail recursive manner, we might say def sum x and then the running total. So in this way, we keep a balanced total. and we do the calculation, the important thing here is running total, uh, running underscore total plus x. That means the calculation has been moved before 
we have actually made the call. Why would you actually use this in Ruby and not a block? To be honest, there are not a lot of serious use cases, but there is one. If you have to walk a recursive structure like a tree or a rather complex API endpoint that, you know, we've all, we, they're all, they're, we've, all, we've all dealt with bad API endpoints. If you ever have to walk one that's difficult and very memory intensive, this will dramatically reduce your memory cost. Uh, Ruby does not perform uh, TCO, uh, tail call optimization by default. You do actually have to specify that. I believe someone can, spec someone can probably yell at me when I'm over. I think this was introduced in 1.9. Uh, I don't know 100% on that, though. And then finally, the last thing uh, that's something that I like uh, is monads. This is something that uh, if you have ever programmed in Haskell or if you have heard the Twitter people, um, the Twitter guys that kind of go into this, this is something that's really uh, seen a resurgence recently. Um, there's a very popular description for this. Uh, it's kind of legendary. All told, a monad is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors. What's the problem? <laughs> This actually is a sarcastic quote given by James Irie in a brief, incomplete, and mostly wrong history of programming languages. Um, it's specifically to make fun of the common list people that love it so much. In reality, a monad is simply a structure that defines multiple operations as one step. Think of it in a way in the Ruby world as programmable ends. It's not an if else, if else, if else. It's a one structure call that defines all the possible paths that an object can take. We actually have something like this that's very, actually I think probably most people use this every day. Um, my favorite term for this is called a duck monad, and it's this. So this is actually a monad. It's not, it's not technically a monad and then it's not a type, but in reality it's a monad because we are short circuiting the assignment of x. We're saying if x does not have a value, go ahead, but if it does, short circuit it, we don't need to go on. This is an effect, of mo it's a very simple monad, but it's a monad that defines the structure. And then finally, go through that. We're doing that through basically nil punning. Is X defined? If yes, leave it be. If no, go ahead and assign it to Y. So that is the short functional programming world, and I appreciate y'all listening to that.